Thank you very much, John. Um, I know some people here, um, I've emailed most people here, harassed or harangued. Um, yes, my name is Sean Owens. I'm a the GPT registrar in the Northeast GP training scheme, but I only work about 500 yards up the road from here, off the North Circular Road. I'll start with this little lady. Does anyone know her name? The Swedish schoolgirl, Greta Thorberg, who has gone on school strike because she's so dismayed by her, uh, not only her politicians, but her adults in general that they aren't listening and they aren't watching. And I just find it fascinating that she doesn't say very much, but one image can make you feel wholly inadequate, and it's because she's right. So I don't have an activism story to match that, but I do have one. Last year, myself and my colleagues in the Northeast GP training scheme, directors and all, we wrote letters to our local hospitals in the region, asking them effectively what's going on with the diet. And of course, we wrote the letter more eloquently than that. Um, but we, were, and we didn't expect to affect any change. But what we did want to say was, your patients are our patients. You see what you're feeding them. What is it? <laughs> And um, the responses vary from no response, and it's very hurtful to be ghosted, um, to who's your use. <laughs> so if anyone here is saying, who is this GP registrar who tells me about diet, especially if there's dietitians in the audience, it's quite understandable, I get it. But what I want to do today is provide rationale for the other talkers to say why this is important to talk about. And I'll tell you about myself now. I'm from County Down. I studied my Master's of Pharmacy at Queen's University of Belfast. I worked as a community pharmacist for about 10 years. Uh, when I was 30, I went on to study graduate medicine in UCD. Uh, to cut a long story short, nine years later, uh, here I am a few months away from uh, graduating as a GP. And it is true what they say. Doctors are not taught about nutrition in any meaningful fashion. A lot of other medicine, but that one's true. But what we are taught is, I think, a more powerful superpower, and that is how to be skeptical, critical, and how to review the evidence. So, I want to take the pulse of the nation, where we are, I want to talk about where we're going, and I'm going to give everyone an out, why we should focus on diet, why it's okay to ignore, and then I'll come back and say why we should. And then I'll take a verb, talk about the planet, and typically, Diet and planet didn't go hand in hand, but I'll show you why that is now changing. So where are we now? So when we're talking about diet and nutrition, it's difficult to know, uh, sorry, nutrition and medicine, it's, it's difficult to know where to start. So I've just picked three places that say a lot to me. Number one, this is the most recent revised uh, World Cancer Research Fund report on colorectal cancer uh, risk factors. And you will see. Top right, up in red, alongside alcohol and obesity, a high risk factor for colorectal cancer is red and processed meat. Today, now, somewhere across the road, St. Monica's Ward, or any of the other teaching hospitals in Dublin, somebody who has had their colorectal tumor resected, there would be day four or five post-operative, their stoma is functioning perfectly, they're going to have their first meal, and the chances are, that will contain red or processed meat. And you may say that that is totally unethical, and you may say, well, it's just bad optics because the absolute risk is so low. But I think it speaks to something different, and that is what I describe as an institutional indifference to diet and medicine. And I'll show you what I mean. This is starting point number two. The largest risk factor survey ever conducted by the Bill and the Gates Foundation uh, has now said that in developed countries, diet is now unstripped tobacco as the number one cause for death and disability. The World Health Organization also said this. And you would think then that front and center in medical education would be nutrition. As a 2014 medical graduate, I can say that is not the case unless how sausages are made counts. And as a final year, GP training, I can say that it's a glaring omission. So this is our ICGP, Irish College of GPs, um, uh, syllabus, our curriculum. And these are all the different domains. And here's where nutrition 
isn't. <laughs> and these are all the domains where nutrition is implicit in the pathogenesis, in the prevention, in the treatment. So I think it's an unmet need to say the least. And starting point number three, we are a really sick country. This is the most recent health, the Ireland report. And up top, the number one cause of death and disability is cardiovascular disease. And it's treated like a disease of aging, an inevitable disease, but it's really a disease of aging in Ireland, or a Western country. And it is reversible. Only one drug, device, or diet has ever been shown to reverse our number one killer. No one knows about it. It's never been in a cardiology letter I've read. Um, of course, it's a plant-based diet. So that's our starting points. Uh, number two, our second largest cause of death is cancer, perhaps a function of our uh, aging population. Rates go up and up. And the thing that really scares me is, of course, the diabetes epidemic. So when I started pharmacy uh, back in 2000, it was, I think, a prevalence of 2 or 3 percent. You could never really get a hold of it. You still don't know exactly, but they said at least six and a half percent. So within my working generation, or my working lifetime, it's already doubled. And it's expected to have doubled again by 2050. So it's not a genetic <coughs> disease per se, it's obviously environmental. And it goes hand in hand with the obesity epidemic. So now six in ten Irish adults are overweight or obese, and a quarter of the children. And the World Health Organization estimate we will top the European League by 2030, and that's revised now. So to juxtaposition that, this is very Irish indeed. You're talking to uh, your patient, they have liver function tests that are off, they have high lipids, they have blood sugar levels. How is your diet, Mary? It's good, doctor. So <laughs> this is our elite uh, self-reporting good health countries. We're uh, so, uh, But it does make it difficult to enter this into the conversation because we're apparently all eating well. And, and maybe, maybe there's just something wrong with the typical Irish diet. So where are we going? Tonight? No one has an answer for the uh, the aging question, whether it's pension or, or whatnot. And you should, but it is a particular Irish problem. If you look at the pale green line here, you can see Ireland has been accumulating over 65 year olds in our population at a far greater rate than the pale yellow line the rest of Europe. And that's looking back over the last uh, last 10 years. But looking forward, the CSO tells us that we will have an extra 1 million over 65 year olds by 2046. And these little colours just are tangled with the, the, uh, the demographic breakups. But the issue here is of course uh, the chronic disease that comes along with that, but particularly what brightens me is dementia. Um, so the most recent report from Trinity and uh, Galway tell us that by that same date we'll have an extra 100,000 people in Ireland extra living with dementia. And the majority of these, uh, the ones in red, will be living in the community. So I thought I'd just stop here and think about what Ireland looks like with an extra 100,000 people with dementia. Because I typically see people with dementia in nursing homes, and anyone who goes to nursing homes knows they're building, right? They're putting on a wing. And the ones I see on a day-to-day basis are the carers. And they come, usually at the, when they're at the end of their tether, they're broken and empty. And they don't take breaks or holidays. And when they, they're totally emotionally and physically exhausted, they say, doctor, I think home needs to go and uh, home, I can't give it everything. And that's when you have to break the news that this might take two or three years. And they don't even look disappointed, they're just like withdrawn, gaunt, empty. So, back in 2010 when I started uh, medicine, I wanted to be a neurologist. Until I read up on the treatments for some of the neurological conditions, and there aren't many. Our starting point isn't good because we have one of the uh, below average uh, number of doctors per capita in Europe. So here we are in green, here's the European average. And our starting point is that of saturation. So this is from the Irish Medical Times a few, years, uh, a few months ago saying that we have an all year running trolley crisis. And any 
NCHDs here can attest to that. So what is the plan for the budget? This is the most recent uh, roundtable report. It goes back about 2012, so maybe a little bit dated. But they're pinning all their hopes on, by 2025, we will have drugs that will reverse the damage caused by dementia. In the interim since that report, Big Pharma have pulled all funding for these molecules. There's going to be no pill in, uh, in shining armor. So prevention is the only game in town. Thankfully, pioneers like Bresden and the Public <coughs> Institute of UCLA and the Charzais and uh, Loma Linda, Rush University Chicago, they're all now calling the Alzheimer's type 3 diabetes. They're saying this is reversible, but you've got to start now, and the cornerstone is nutrition. And when you search this 80 page document for the words nutrition or diet, you're not the game. I wonder, is Joe Clark here yet? Anyway, one of my program directors recently did some postgraduate work in Alzheimer's. And again, nutrition is not on the agenda whatsoever, so prevention is the only game in time for dementia. I think it goes back to diabetes. And mea culpa, I have two really well respected healthcare degrees. And I got through without really understanding diabetes. I thought of something to do with um, blood sugar levels. Of course, that comes way later. So this is a really good paper. I encourage everyone to read it by um, Roy Taylor. It's not called Roy Walker there. <laughs> Roy Taylor from uh, Newcastle in uh, the UK. And he's the one behind the direct study showing how we can reverse diabetes at home. Anyway, it makes it really simple. I'm not going through the paper. I just want to show you one. Uh, one graph. It's from the Whitehall 2 study. This was 6,000 uh, UK civil servants followed up for about 15 years. And about 500 <coughs> people who developed diabetes. So these were diabetics. And what he's saying is this was always happening. We could see it if we had been checking things like fasting insulin, and insulin resistance, or even just tracking uh, fasting glucose. And this explains to me what why we can predict that we're going to double our number of diabetics in the next 20 years. So this could be, for example, the, this is a lemon, so you know I go this analogy. This could be the taxi driver that comes to see you, and you take the bloods and you're sure he's diabetic, he's symptomatic, but everything's back normal, even the liver function tests. And even though they're overweight and sedentary, they get falsely reassured. Whatever you're doing, keep doing it as you think what's said. This could be the woman who has a big baby, four and a half kilos, and is told at some point in the future you're at higher risk for diabetes. That's because they are already hyperinsulin. This could be the lady who has gestational diabetes, and blood sugar is returned to normal a few months afterwards, but a year later is a full-blown diabetic. And this starts to me to look a little bit like a conveyor belt. Six and ten on what population I believe are on this conveyor belt. And if you get really abstract, Follow me here. <laughs> and if you, you turn that study upside down, literally, I think it starts to look like a cliff. And where are all the adults going to go into primary care? And what does primary care look like for them? <laughs> Normal filament and bulk <laughs> is, is the answer. So don't be a GP if that is the story. And it might sound like hyperbole, but this is actually happening. This is from the last two years ago. Prevalence of diabetes around the world within a lifetime. So the red lines are uh, 1980, the blue, big blue lines are present day, and you can see the Far East are being swamped by this tsunami of diabetes as we export our diet to them. So it doesn't matter if it's Trump care, Obamacare, or Ad Care would have sounded nice. <laughs> <laughs> There, there's no model of healthcare that can sustain this. With all that in mind, here's why you might not want to bother talking about diet. The list is like the same length as your arm. So it's a difficult modality. The nutritional uh, epidemiology and evidence is hard to tease apart. Causation happens a long time before we see uh, disease. You can eat a burger today and you'll be fine tomorrow. So it's very difficult to uh, to, to get a hold of what's going on. And it's not really our speciality. Uh, where are the dietitians and all of this? And the nutritionists, surely they should be taking this on. Oh, no, when you put your head above the parapet, you, you 
to become a plant-based doctor or the woolly kind of doctor. But actually the science is really good, but you're swimming upstream a little bit, and that's uncomfortable. You're never going to buy a house in Enniscary <laughs> getting your patients to go plant-based. But I mean this literally because as healthcare professionals, and most of us here are healthcare professionals, we make our money by selling our time. And discussing diet and changing behaviours can be incredibly time consuming. And that is an issue. If we aren't rewarded, if the government isn't going to uh, uh, prioritise this, we're kind of doing it out of our uh, vocational uh, need. And like I said, behaviour change is really hard. So much of it is environmental. So much of it is mental. And to be honest, it's not open for economies by the side of the road. Um, as I always say, no one swoons when the plant based doctor out there. <laughs> Unless, of course, you're a creamy, and now that kind of works. This is why you should focus on that. Okay, so it's difficult epidemiology, but we're all well educated healthcare professionals. We can come to terms with this. And we don't have to write to the minister to get approved for a plant based diet. It's there, the first diet of every supermarket open in the country. It's not our speciality. So, yes, how many community dietitians in Ireland would anyone like to hazard a guess? Six in ten of us overweight or obese. And ten percent of the diabetic. So, there's about a hundred. And you take maternity and sick pay into effect, it's probably about 80 at any one time. So like anything, it's going to fall on us to sort out. Um, we hope to critique, but it doesn't matter. If you've got an evidence base, you can stand up and say what you believe. And where is the evidence base for the diet we've been prescribing all along? Okay, there's no money, but it doesn't matter. We have to focus on the needs of our community, and that's nutrition. While behaviour change is hard, the results are spectacular. I'm not going to talk about all the outcomes that uh, Tom and Alan and Shireen are going to talk about. I'm talking about the first thing is back to you in hard. I followed that recipe. Do I need those blood pressure tablets? I don't, that's great. And that is really rewarding, if not monetarily rewarding. And while it's not sexy, I think it speaks to our vocation. And this is what I'm talking about. This is modern day healthcare from a pharmacist and doctor's perspective. So these mops are called Mopabubil and Mopabubab. They are very expensive. They are recombinant. After they have special approval for them, they're very absorbent. Uh, double shafted. <laughs> um, with lifestyle interventions, particularly plant based nutrition, you put the mop down, you walk up to the top, you turn it off. And whilst the epidemic has crossed all uh, demographics, gender, age, social class, so too does the answer because we don't have food swamps and food deserts like the United States. Every supermarket I've been to in Ireland has, has fresh produce. If I was to go back to one thing, no, it's about community. As I said, I only work about 100 yards away, uh, off the North Circle Road. I work with Dr. Austin Carroll, Sorka, Brenda, and a whole spectacular team. And I don't know if anyone knows about Austin O'Carroll, but his team do some spectacular work in here, so we don't. Soup kitchens, you know, uh, clinics in hostels, a bus that goes out to meet the homeless, we work with migrant communities, disadvantaged communities, and when I started working with Austin, I thought this was purely, purely vocational and uh, uh, volunteerism, but Austin said it's more than that. You must meet the needs of your community. Otherwise, you're a square peg for a round to war. And if you don't do that, there's no sure far away to become disillusioned, money oriented um, And I think by that proxy, Austin, if you were working in South Dublin, you would be doing letters and tucks. Would that be correct? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think this is what it all comes down to. And then planetary health. So I was recently at a talk by a man called Sir Professor Andy Haynes from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. He's been leading this planetary health charge. And he opened the lines with, our climate has now entered a new epoch. Well, he had me at epoch. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I really listened then. Um, effectively, what he said is, there is a relationship between our 
bit and our patients and our planet we cannot ignore it. And it's not just Sir Andy Haynes saying this, this is from the uh, WACA, which is the International Federation of Family Doctors. And just last week, they issued a declaration asking not Irish doctors, all doctors around the world, get active. They're saying there's no longer acceptable to be a doctor with an interest in nutrition. You can no longer be the healthcare professional with an interest in climate. It's all of us. We were singled out out of six groups, healthcare professionals, to lead the charge. And as John just said, this just came through my letterbox yesterday. We're being, we're being called out. We're all in the So, just play this. This is a NASA time lapse of uh, the polar ice caps. And I call this the home store of no more program because once the polar ice caps are gone, they're truly gone. And, um, I think it speaks to the, the, the hubris of our government. Because why this is happening, we trade carbon credits, and we pay carbon tithes. And meanwhile, a Swedish schoolgirl sits outside Parliament saying, it's not good enough. It's not really working, but you get, the, you get the idea. And we can feel a little bit isolated. The planet's over there, we're here. One thing that's made the world be very small to me is Google Maps. So here we are in Echo Street. And if you click down a few times, you see Dublin. A few times, you see Ireland. And a few more times, you see we are as offensive as anyone. Furthermore, we can be really good role models. This is called the Charlie Hockey Program. Okay? <laughs> it shows about how far above our means we've been living over the last 40 or 50 years. And this is from a really neat website called Global Footprints. And they look at our ecological footprint. And the Y graph is really they're thinking this is the number of planets we would need for everyone to live in the style that we've become accustomed to. That's pretty damn right. It says to me we've lived out for long enough on the plastic bag ban. It says to me that up here around the time of the crash, when the helicopters were coming into the tents in the uh, Galway races, it was more than that. It was the food that we were reading. The degree of change that's needed to save our health and climate can be overwhelming. It is overwhelming. And that can lead to, lead to stasis. But if I was to say, if you could do one thing, and one thing only, to make a positive impact, find your body is to change your diet to a plant-based body. And not the level that Sir Andy Haynes' grass, Greta Thornburg's grass. And the opening <coughs> paragraph of the Lancer report says exactly what's going on. Why is it that we've been consuming so much and not noticing it. We have been more to help the future generations to realize economic development in the present. He's saying that we're going to have to pay for all of this. But there's a number of that now, it's 20, 30. So, Greta, by saying not very much, has spoken uh, incredibly loud, and she's now started something rather special. So, I think it's rather time for us to listen to the kids. Um, she started a, a, a movement that's coming to Ireland soon. And I'll just take it to the bottom line. The solutions within the systems are so impossible to find, maybe we should change the system itself. So if it's uncomfortable, that's called change, and I think that's good. Here we are, Dublin. Uh, next week, there's going to be a, a march to the Dáil. So it's happening now. This could not be more timely. Um, before I stop, just to bring it back to the, uh, the uh, open gambit, who am I to talk to you about nutrition? Well, when I was in medical school, I never put my hand up. I was either passive or passed out or not there. <laughs> but I'm putting my hand up now for a number of reasons. So number one, this is what happens when you work with Austin O'Carroll for any length of time. You become very active. Number two, the World Health, forget that, there's now international consensus bar Donald Trump and Exxon Mobil, that we've got till 2030 to slow out our climate. And perhaps it's a function of my age, or my hairline, or that my wife had a second child a few months ago. But I can see that really closely. It's a stone's throw away. And we don't need any more commissions or reports. We need to act. The third reason is, 
you could call it a cosmic coincidence that the diet that will save us from health bankruptcy is the same one that will save us from planetary bankruptcy. Or you could say that it's Mother Earth giving us a nudge. I think she is screaming at us. And fourthly, I don't know I'll ever have a chance to address so many compassionate, caring uh, healthcare professionals as, as I, I am right now because you've given up your time from your family, you pay to be here, you give up your park room to be here, and I think that everyone here is part of the solution. So the rest of today is about solutions. I hope you enjoy it, I hope you're skeptical, I hope you afford that same skepticism to the status quo, and enjoy today. Thank you so much.